And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. This man, Saul, is going to be the man in the rest of the book of Acts that we're going to read under the name Paul. Paul the Apostle, uh, we would know him also for a number of letters that he wrote to the New Testament church, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if they found any of this way, great statement to underline, because that's what they called the believers at this point. They had not been yet been called Christians uh, in Antioch, so they talked about of this way, talking about uh, the Jesus way, really, uh, disciples of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? If you have a red letter edition of the scripture, that's going to show up in, in red letters, meaning the voice of Jesus. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So he is commanded, Saul is commanded here, at his conversion experience by the Lord to go into the city. Why is that important? Let's continue reading. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice and seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. At this point, the scripture indicates that his sight is impaired. And he was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Wow. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named... Ananias. And to him, the Lord said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Can I ask you a question just for a quick moment? If the Lord spoke to you directly, would you recognize it? That's just an honest question. Ananias knew immediately that it was the Lord. He said, Lord, I'm here. He recognized the voice of the Lord. We live in such a distracted age. I'm talking about adults. That it's difficult for us sometimes to still our minds and still our hearts to hear the Lord speak. We are addicted to noise and distractions. Do you have time where you just disconnect? It doesn't matter to me where it is, whether it's you're driving or you're out in the field, where you are just there and you say, Lord, I'm here, I'm listening. Well, Ananias recognized the voice of the Lord. He said, Behold, I'm, I am here, Lord. Verse 11. And the Lord said unto him, Ananias, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And I know at this point, Ananias fell over. Okay, the Bible doesn't tell us that, but I'm sure he did. He said, There's a guy named Saul. And it's the Saul of Tarsus, the guy who persecutes and kills Christians. He's praying. And I have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. God had already worked in the heart of Saul and directed him and told him, there's a guy coming, his name is Ananias, he's going to be there. And now the Lord tells, it's, your parents do this to you sometimes. I already told them you're going to call. Or I already told them you're going to come by, so you have to. And that's what the Lord is doing to Ananias. He's telling him, I've already set up this divine appointment. I need you to go see him. And Ananias answered, 
Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. I love how Ananias deflects it here. He says, Lord, he's hurting you. What he's afraid of is that he's going to be hurt. And he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. And the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went on his way, entered into the house, and putting his hands on him. Look at what he said. He said, Brother Saul. The Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was saw certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. This morning in the message, I'd like to talk about personalization. That we as believers, in order to really capture a heart for missions, that we as believers understand God intends for us to have contact with missionaries. It's not enough to just give to missions. And I think Roger City Baptist Church and those of you who are here do an incredible job at giving faithfully. And I mentioned this uh, last week and a week before that. I don't believe that missions is about squeezing more money out of God's people. That is not biblical missions. But I believe it's really capturing the mind and heart of God. And one of the things, one of the elements of missions is personalization. Where we understand that the missionaries are people. Here's a man named Saul. He can't see. And he's been told by the Lord that he has a special job for him and somebody is coming to help him. Boy, Saul's in a unique spot, isn't it? Uh, here he is at the mercy of believers, the same people that he's been persecuting. And now the believers are going to come and come to his side and help him. But it only happens because somebody named Ananias is willing to go and be that person. God prepared and knew that Ananias would go and be that person. In person, he didn't write him a letter. Say, hey Saul, I'm praying for you that, that God will give you sight. And uh, here's ten bucks to go to McDonald's. And God bless you, my friend. No, he went in person. Do you see where he laid his hands on him? Heavenly Father, help us as we understand this truth from your word and how important it is that this very same thing continues through us to effect the gospel message around the world. Help us be obedient to it in your name. Amen. So in the book of Acts chapter number 9 at the conversion of Saul, we understand that Saul will become Paul and we know that Paul is going to be a tremendous vessel to get the gospel around the world. We know the lingering effects of Paul's ministry as early as the year 200 after Christ left. We know that the gospel message was being spread all the way into Europe, to England, and all the way even to Ireland. These islands, these island nations were reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ because of, I believe, the missionary effort and influence of a man named Saul. But right at the very beginning, the Bible shows us that God put a man named Ananias in Saul's path so that Ananias could be that person that went to him and reached out to him, prayed with him, laid his hands on him, and said, Hey, you're my brother in Christ. I affirm you. 
I affirm what you believe in. And I'm going to show you as a brother in Christ that the same Jesus that affected your life has influenced my life. And I want you to know we're on the same team. We're pulling together. We are serving a common master. We have a common goal, a common mission. Let's do this. That's what Ananias was doing for Paul. And it was an unlikely encourager because, to be honest, Ananias was not happy about the whole thing. And I'm not trying to invent that or read into the scriptures, but we see that when the Lord gives the mission to Ananias, Ananias rebuts it and says, Lord, I want you to know, the guy you're talking about here, this is the same man that's persecuting the church. And the Lord said, I know. But he's a chosen vessel for me, and I want you to go to him. There have been times as pastor, there have been times before I was a pastor serving in a local church that the Lord has prompted me to do things or help individuals that are missionaries. And I'll be honest, there are times when me as an individual, what the Lord was asking me to do just didn't line up with me. I remember sharing with my wife one time, we had, a, we had a couple come in and I told her, I said, you know, I'll be honest, I don't really like this missionary couple. And I can't remember if my wife laughed or scolded me, one of the two. And the lesson that the Lord was teaching me was this. You know, the Lord uses many different persons and personalities in his work. And sometimes... Uh, the people that the Lord uses are just different than we are. I mean, sometimes, even personality-wise, we just don't click. Did you know that you don't have to click with somebody to be obedient to the Lord? You know, Paul and Peter, if you read it out in the book of Acts, there are many times where Paul and Peter just weren't on the same page. I think it was just personality difference. Uh, Paul was, had a very uh, uh, gregarious type personality. He was very vocal, very outspoken. And whatever was on his mind came out of his mouth. Uh, that was Peter. And Paul was a very dynamic person as well. Very eloquent in his speech. And, but you know, the Lord used each of them uniquely in their ministries. So when Ananias was given the mission, the Bible tells us he did it. And I want you to see in verse number 20 the result of Ananias' willingness to reach out to this man. I want you to see the immediate result. We know the long-term result. Paul be began to be used in an incredible way and became a catalyst for reaching the gospel to the Gentiles. And straight away, right away, after Paul received this contact from Ananias, he was so strengthened, he was so filled with the Holy Ghost, he was emboldened and received, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them that is called on the name, that called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? So there's still this suspicion that maybe this is all trickery, that Paul is just putting this on and that he's going to turn around and grab them. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwell at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. What was the proof? What was the affirmation of Paul's early ministry? That Ananias went to him, laid on him his hands, he received the Holy Ghost, and what Paul was doing was not possible in his own strength but the Holy Spirit was emboldening him and they said it has to be it has to be and after many days were fulfilled the Jews took counsel to kill him but their laying wait was known of Saul and they watched in the gates day and night to kill him then the disciples took him by the night by night and led him down by the wall in a basket 
And when Saul was, co was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join him to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. God placed divinely Ananias in Saul's path to be that person. So the first encouragement for you is, when there is a believer that's new in the faith, now I want you to write this down as a question if you're taking notes. What am I doing to affirm new believers? What am I doing to affirm, I love it, I listen to the scripture like that all the time. There we go. That's the blue letter Bible, isn't it? There's something about the way that sounds. So, what am I doing? What are you doing? What am I doing to affirm new believers? Now, I'm going to be very honest. I wonder how many times a new believer is a potential missionary or servant of the Lord that does not receive that encouragement and that strength at the beginning and really has an unrealized ministry because we're not willing to affirm them. Number two, I want you to see another man that God used. A person. Somebody physically to be a part of Saul's life. Verse number 26. The man's name, I'm not going to hide it, is Barnabas. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas. I have that underlined. You know how much difference one person can make. But Barnabas. Who's Barnabas? Well, that wasn't his real name, but the Bible says that his name was a given, it was a nickname, and it's son of consolation. Barney, uh, son of consolation. It's just a nickname that was given to him because this man was so encouraging, and God used Barnabas to take Saul, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, how that he had spoken to him, how that he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus, and and he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him. But when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Verse number 31. Look at the scripture here. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were, what's the next word? Edified, built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. That, in verse 31, did not happen until verse number 27. I want you to see that. Now, I'm not trying to make some... Uh, connection that isn't there, but as the Lord lays it out chronologically for us, there was something about Barnabas bringing Paul to the apostles, explaining to them what his testimony was, said, look, here's a man that the Lord saved, here's what I've observed. Again, he's affirming him, he's walking with him, he's going along with him, he's introducing him to, and this is just such an incredible picture of missions. Here's a man who believes in Saul and his ministry. He's introducing him to other people and said, look, God not only is going to use him, God is using him. And because of that, the Bible says there was a rest, there was growth, and the Bible says the gospel, gospel ministry was multiplied. Why? I believe that a key to this that we often overlook, is Barnabas. Five different times in the scripture, the Bible shows us the ministry of Barnabas and how important Barnabas was 
to encourage and edify the saints. If I had time, I'd have you go to the book of uh, Acts chapter number 13. You'd read down uh, from verse number 1 and following, and you'd see how Barnabas ended up traveling with Saul, going on his missions, adventures. Now, I want you to think about that. Because we often think of Paul as the strong missionary, and we often think of Barnabas as his tag-along. But it wasn't that way. Who is the more mature disciple? Barnabas. And oftentimes we look at younger individuals in the faith, well, I can't learn anything from him. What is he going to do? And God used Barnabas in a unique way. I believe that Barnabas was still in that mode where he was encouraging and teaching Paul. Saying, Paul, you have this. You can do this. You're doing great. And the importance of encouragement in person. When is the last time that you personally have encouraged a missionary? I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Uh, you have Twitter, you have Facebook, you have email. You have so many different ways that you can reach out to individuals to tell them, hey, I'm proud of you. I'm excited about what God's doing in your life. I just read your missionary letter. Your missionary letter was just read at church. I want you to know I'm so excited that we get to be a part of what you do. Most of the time when I read a missions letter, uh, I just send, and I'll be honest, I'm not uh, eloquent. I'm not writing a full page of letter. I'll just send a quick note. Most of the time it's just replying to an email. I'll say, I just read your missionary letter. I prayed for you and I'm so proud of you. And I'll mention something so excited about what God's doing in your life. And I promise you, it's never more than a day I'll receive a response back. Thank you so much. It's so good to know that people are reading our letters and that people are praying for us. Barnabas, the son of consolation, he's an encourager. He's encouraging Saul in the Lord. He is traveling with Saul. He is a more seasoned man, but here he's willing to encourage this man. Number three, there's one other individual, a person, that I believe that God used in Paul's ministry in a very unique way, and I'll show it to you in the book of Acts, chapter number 16. Are you ready? We'll go there quickly, and then we'll finish up. Personification. These are people, real people. They have real needs. They have to go grocery shopping. I spoke to uh, one of our missionaries some years ago. And they said, you know, out of seven days in a week, two of our days are spent just getting food and reliable water. That doesn't sound very missionary e, does it? But that's what they have to do. Uh, they don't have the kind of grocery stores that we have available, even in Roger City. Somebody told me there's a Dollar General going up at Grand Lake. I'm laughing a little bit. Uh, those, they pop up everywhere. They don't have them. They don't have them on the mission field. And sometimes just going to market and getting food and then getting reliable water will take as much as two days out of a missionary schedule. But that's what's required to be on the field. This man, Acts chapter 16, verse number 1, Then came he, so this is Paul, Saul, to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus. Timotheus here, he's a disciple, he's a grown man, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewish, Jewess, and believed, in, but his father was a Greek, which was well reported of the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and he took and circumcised him because the Jews that were in those quarters, for they knew that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, 
that they were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith. Read the next phrase with me. And increased in number daily. When did that happen? Again, no mistake. Chronologically it happened after Paul has this encounter and is joined by Timothy. And here's the third individual that I wanted to bring to your attention as we think of personification. And there's something very specifically that I would like you to ask yourself or to put on the list to do. The first one is we talked about Ananias. And the question was, do you affirm new believers? What am I doing when there's a new believer in the faith? What am I doing to help root and ground that believer in the faith. Number two, what am I doing to encourage new missionaries? What am I doing, whether it's a written letter, it may even be a gift in a letter, or a word of encouragement when they come. Sometimes a missionary needs a green handshake, and that's just, just that little action is such an encouraging thing. But then I want you to see as Paul becomes a more seasoned missionary, there's something that was a tremendous encouragement to him, and that was this man named Timothy. And I want you to see why. We're going to continue. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Turn quickly to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. 2 Timothy, chapter number 4. The thing number three that I'd like to encourage you to do or the question that you could ask yourself is, do I pray for our missionaries that God will give them a protege? That God will give them a preacher boy? That God will give them somebody that they can teach and instruct that can continue their ministry? That's Timothy. So we're in the book of uh, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. You see, Timothy was somebody that Paul could share his heartbeat with. 2 Timothy 4, the scripture says this in verse number 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He's saying, Timothy, <laughs> I'm getting down to the end here. And the truth is, pretty soon they're going to they're going to kill me. I'm going to be killed for my faith. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. He said, I'm not regretful or remorseful. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me, all, uh, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love is appearing. But notice verse number 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demoth has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only look as with me, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitable me. For the ministry in Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. You know what Paul needed? <laughs> he's an older man now. He just needed that encouragement to see Timothy one more time, I believe as a reminder that the work of the ministry would continue when he was gone. That was his heartbeat. He said, Timothy, come see me. I just need a little encouragement. I need to see you. He said, everybody else is busy and they're doing what they're supposed to do. But would you come see me? Would you come see me? Notice what his mission is. His mission in 1 Timothy, he said uh, that his mission was souls. He said that God is good, acceptable in the sight of God, that all men would be saved and come to the knowledge. And then he said also in the book of Romans, chapter number one, he said, I'm a debtor. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul's mission was to reach souls. But I believe that Paul was very aware of what his posterity was. Look in 2 Timothy chapter number two. We should be right there in verse number one. Thou therefore, what's the next two words? My son. 
This is a big deal for missionaries. It's a big deal. Thou therefore, my son. And that's what uh, Brother Castellon is. He's somebody's Timothy. He is the product of somebody winning somebody to Christ, training and teaching, and now that individual that is poured into his life is going to see his ministry continued through him. And that's a big deal. Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. I believe that God used these three individuals. God used many people in Paul's life. But I believe that God used these three individuals at very crucial times. We're talking about personalizing the missionaries. Real people. When my parents first got saved, there was a couple that was attending the same church at the same time. They were a little more grown in the faith. Their names are John and Bobby Buchanan. The Lord used them. I think that um, the Buchanans were there and were uh, one of two couples that were there when my mom got saved. In time, as the Lord would have it, they both left their home church as missionaries out of the home church at the same time. Uh, Bob Buchanan and his wife went to Saskatchewan, Canada. They had kind of envisioned they might go to the mission field together. They went to northern Saskatchewan. My parents went to Mexico. And uh, you couldn't pick two farther apart places. But these, this couple was a couple that was very critical and very important right in the very early days. For my parents, the Buchanans were their Ananias. Then after being saved for a short while and actually getting to the mission field, the Lord brought another couple into their life. Their last names were the Grigsby's. And God used uh, Jack Grigsby in an incredible way very learned man, very wise in the scripture. And he was a Barnabas to my dad. He was like a son. My dad was like a son to Jack Grigsby. And uh, he, the Lord just used him. He took him under wing. Taught him really, I believe, a lot of what my dad knew doctrinally and got him rooted and grounded doctrinally in the scripture. In our church library, you notice some of the books say Grigsby on them. Those are some of the books that Jack Grigsby had given to my dad to just get him rooted and grounded doctrinally in the scripture. Very instrumental in just getting him rooted and grounded in the scripture and just being very patient and diligent with him, teaching him about a lot of things, teaching him which doctrinal things to avoid and uh, the dangers of ecumenism and all these different things. And then in time, the thing that became more important to my dad was raising up a new generation, his Timothys. And at the time that my dad passed away, there are 35 different individuals that he personally trained that in some capacity are serving in full-time ministry. Now that's not to toot anybody's horn. If anybody gets the praise, the credit, and the glory, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to see how God uses people. And God wants to use you to affirm new believers, to be an encouragement to missionaries that are already doing it, and to be that individual who encourages new Timothys on the way. If we don't do it, the gospel ministry will stagnate. We need missionaries more now than ever. I, you would be alarmed the rate at which missionaries are coming off the field because they're retiring. They're too old to do it anymore. And I'm talking, I mean, like end of life too old. And we need more missionaries. How is that going to happen? 
I believe one of the critical ways that that happens is personification.